week's edition of World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Topley speaking to you from a rainy and dank Washington, D.C., but we are warmed with the light of victory. A very severe defeat has been inflicted on the forces of the one-party state. There has indeed been a blue wave, O oh, ye of little faith, O oh, ye of short attention spans. It is a blue wave, and it has already consigned the People's House to the Democrats. The People's House has been ripped from the hands of the Republican tyrants and usurpers of the one-party state, and it has now been assigned to the positive opposition, as distinct to this gang of thugs. The president, always a hooligan, is now exposed as a hooligan gone berserk in defeat. His frenetic activity already building up before the midterms, as he undoubtedly read those devastating private polls, which were telling him more like the real extent of his failure. Trump is a loser. After this week, Trump goes into the ranks of the losers. Deal with that, Trump. And he is also a weakling. And in addition to being a loser and a weakling, he goes into the ranks of the bunglers. The bunglers, meaning that his harebrained meddling in this election, have, has magnified his losses. I'm thinking in particular of the state of Nevada, where Trump, as you'll remember, told Tarkanian, hey, Tarkanian, drop out in favor of Dean Heller. We've got a Congress race that you can go and contest. So Heller has lost. Senate pick up for the Democrats, one seat. And Tarkanian defeated in the Congressional contest. So, a complete strikeout for loser Don. He um, also then um, will have to deal with that uh, triple threat. Loser, weakling, bungler. There is a blue wave. Now, of course, the blue wave has to crash through the abati. It has to crash through the concertina wire, the NATO wire of uh, of course, of uh, uh, gerrymandering. But as of right now, our best bet is that the Democrats have picked up 31 seats in the House of Representatives, and there are probably about two more, 12, I'm sorry, 12 more seats that still have to be decided. So that is a wave. Com comparable. Let's go back and look at some comparable uh, statistics. If you remember 2006, you will remember what a big deal that was. The 2006 election was, of course, the Iraq War election, and it was a stinging rebuke to Bush and Cheney. Bush figured it out. He said that was a thumping. Yeah, it was a thumping. By the way, Bush, the uh, younger reprobate though he was, has a sense, had a sense of reality. Right? Bush, the younger, called it a thumping. Obama called it a shellacking. Trump called it a great victory. So we're left wondering, <laughs> if somebody comes with handcuffs, what is he going to call that? So this is... Uh, and as we, we explained this week, this is now the bunker. This is now spring 1945, April 1945, in the bunker, where a deranged leader moves armies around on the map, which no longer exist, and convinces himself that there can be operations when the wherewithal to do that is long gone. So this, of course, is a danger, as that devastating comparison points out. So it was 31 seats gained in 2006 total, and it's already 31 seats now, 
and that can probably get up to about 37 seats. And 37 seats is far more than what usually changes hands in these off-year elections. The average is about 20, or just a tiny bit above 20, and this is now going to be just a tiny bit short of 40. And, of course, if everything really goes well, we could get up to 43 seats gained by the Democrats. Um, that would be good for me because my prediction still sitting out there is gain of 42. 42. And with that, the People's House, with its immense apparatus of financial control, the tax bills, the House Ways and Means Committee, all of this stuff about taxation, money, budgets, spending bills must originate in the House. So they've, um, they've got him, don't they? They've got him uh, in that department. And, of course, we've now got the new triumvirate, <laughs> the new triumvirate, the triumviri of this coming phase. These are the names that will now be on everybody's lips, Nadler, Cummings, and Schiff. Nadler, Cummings, and Schiff. That sounds like one of the greatest law firms ever, and maybe that it will be vis-a-vis -vis Trump. Gerald Nadler of New York City, chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. Elijah Cummings, Afro-American congressman from Maryland, Chairman of the Government Oversight, Government Operations Committee of the House, and, of course, Schiff, the Chairman of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. So um, that's the triumvirate, the triumviri, the three men. Right In, in Rome, of course, it got to be things like uh, you know Julius Caesar, Pompey, and El Crassus. And then later on, there was another one, another triumvirate. So that is a huge conquest. The entire institutional dynamic is now shifting. Everything that one of these malefactors and anarchists, uh, malefactors of great wealth in the administration, the things they do, will immediately be subjected to oversight hearings, right? You can't have Price running wild, Pruitt running wild, Carson running wild, Stinky Zinky running wild. That is all now much more difficult because they're going to be watching you. And, of course, there will be a certain amount of um, settling of accounts for what these people have already done that the public needs to understand. So this is undoubtedly going to be the bane of Trump's existence. Uh, I'm actually wondering, will he decide at a certain point that given the dangers to himself, his family, and so forth, that it might just better be a good idea to, uh, to resign and get himself out of the uh, conflict zone? We don't know. Now, over here in the Senate, this is uh, fascinating. Uh, on the night of, it looked like the... Um, the Democrats were going to have significant losses and the Republicans significant gains, it may not happen. Right now, the Democrats, with their two independent votes, with Bernie and Angus King of Maine, the two New England states that have sent in independents, they're up to 46 Senate seats locked up. The Republicans have locked up 51 seats. That leaves three seats, and these are now contested. And don't let some damn Republican vote fraud artist tell you otherwise. Florida, Arizona, and Mississippi. And we'll have the story on that in just a minute. In Washington, D.C., and we are broadcasting on the afternoon of uh, Friday, November 9th, 2018. Uh, the stock market is still going. There are significant losses. Uh, minus uh, about 280 at the last time we looked. Um, we've got a worldwide bear market in oil. This is a big deal. We'll be talking about this. So in the Senate, Democrats have secured 44 seats of their own plus two independent seats, 46. 
Republicans have secured 51 seats. It's unfortunate that Claire McCaskill and Donnelly and Heidi Heitkamp could not hold on. But on the other side of the ledger, we congratulate Jackie Rosen for breaking through to expose the bungling idiocy of Trump, his his uh, retainers there, uh, Dean Heller and Tarkanian, both of whom uh, failed ignominiously. So right now the attention is on Florida, Arizona, Mississippi. If the Democrats can win all of those, you will get the status quo ante in the Senate. That would be quite an irony. Now, maybe that won't happen, but it might. It's not mathematically excluded. So what do we got? Most attention is on Florida. Let's do Florida. The Republicans have gone berserk. (laughs) The... uh, The model for this, of course, is their stealing of the 2000 election. You may remember this. Uh, The Brooks Brothers riot. Remember? A bunch of well-heeled, privileged, fresh-faced gluttons of privilege there in the hall of the place where the votes were being counted. The Republicans always want to stop the vote count. Let's see if Kavanaugh is willing to make his debut on a new version of Bush versus Gore, stealing an election. You'll remember in that corridor, we had uh, an aide to Congressman Lightfoot of Iowa, an aide to Congressman uh, Senator Dement, <laughs> Demented of South Carolina, We had a uh, staff counsel of one of the Republican committees, a staffer from the Republican Congressional Committee. We had a staffer for Senator Thompson of Tennessee, staffer of Congressman uh, Hillary of Tennessee, Congress uh, staffer to uh, Congressman Young of Alaska. We also had that guy, Matt Schlapp. Hey, Matt Schlapp, all time's sake. There he is, right in the middle of the gaggle. And they're all making the communist fist salute. Fist salute. But this time for Bush the Younger, right? Don't, don't get trapped into the nostalgia of Bush the Younger. It is severely misplaced. So we ought to go ask Matt Schlapp, now working in the White House, or at least his wife is, For sure. Hey, how was it back then when you shut down the vote count and gave the presidency to Bush the Younger and we got the Iraq War, the Afghan War, we got 9-11 and we got a depression. We got the worst financial panic since 1929. Wasn't that great? Now, they're doing the same thing. (laughs) That's the funny part. We have uh, here a couple of uh, news services have written up. Right on schedule, another Brooks Brothers riot in Florida by the reactionary Republicans. They know they are an unpopular minority, that the most dynamic, the most progressive, the most highly educated, the wealthiest parts of the country are against them. And they have to fall back on uh, methods which are more and more authoritarian and verging on totalitarian. That's the populists, right? Sometimes known as the Sado populists, because the trick of being a populist leader is you've got to savage all kinds of weak and defenseless groups and, of course, ultimately end up savaging your own base. So we had a uh, reactionary Republican gang show up. We've been hearing all about Tucker Carlson. We're not interested. We're interested in the attempt to shut down a vote count uh, in uh, Broward County. Dr. Brendan, Brenda Calhoun Snipes, a Jeb Bush uh, appointee, black woman, and she is getting slammed by Trump, by Scott, by DeSantis. All of them are yelling about Snipes, who is the vote counter the supervisor of elections for Broward County. So they started this off. You can see the um, the YouTube tapes. Lock her up. And they want to lock up uh, now um, this uh, charming lady, uh, Brenda Calhoun 
uh, snipes. And the racist overtones are obviously quite clear. So yesterday in the afternoon, as my, by my observation, the Republican reactionary parrot talk radio universe began going bonkers that the recount was actually succeeding from our point of view and that there's now a fairly substantial chance that, that Senator Nelson will get back in there. Now, the current situation is that uh, with, with Senator Nelson, if the difference between the two candidates is less than one quarter of one percent, that is to say less than 0.25 percent of the vote, there is a legally mandated automatic hand count, manual count of every ballot and vote in the entire state. Once again, great, we'll run that risk. That might help Nelson to get a, what I think he deserves, another term. Now, in the case of Gillum, the gubernatorial candidate, Gillum made his own situation worse by conceding. Not wise, Gillum. Don't do that again if you get a chance, right? That's the Al Gore method. You fall all over yourself trying to con concede to some Republican plug-ugly bully. Don't do it. Hang tough. Fight. Be like Stacey Abrams. Live like her. That's the way to do it. Anyway, Gillum might still save himself, or he might uh, be saved uh, in spite of everything, because he's now within the one-half of 1% 1 required for a, at least a uh, manu for a machine recount, an electronic and machine recount. And, of course, that, recount, that machine recount might take him then below the margin of one-quarter of 1%, one and in that case he gets another chance because then he gets a hand count. He gets a manual count, as I understand it. Now, uh, again, Trump, before jumping on the plane for Gay Paris, Trump uh, screaming about vote fraud and manufacturing votes. Scott, Scott's uh, embodiment of the, uh, uh, I don't know what, the world of the zombies, this guy, uh, an austerity ghoul from head to toe. He's doing legal action, and I think DeSantis too. So we will be back here in just a minute. World crisis of video. Webster Topley here in Washington, D.C. So we've had our second edition of the Brooks Brothers Riot. I wonder if Roger Stone is down there. He claimed, Roger Stone claimed that he got all those Democratic congressional staff, Repu sorry, Republican congressional staff to uh, shut down the vote count in Bush versus Gore, uh, but now this, it's the same idea. The Republicans see that a careful count of legally cast votes, votes which they have attempted to suppress and steal and purloin, and despite all their machinations, they are losing nonetheless because they are an unpopular minority. They don't like to accept that fact. But Republicans are a unpopular Minority, and um, if you look at the French ruling class of 1939 and 1940, in that case you had a ruling class which said, well, we're an unpopular minority, but we want to do our thing and impose our policies no matter what, and they turned to fascism. In that case it was let a fascist invader into the country, and maybe that's uh, some guide to what's uh, possibly on the agenda here. So uh, Scott Scott did a whole tirade, right? Uh, and this is all over Levin and Hannity and Limbaugh. We've been hearing it. It's uh, it's, it's separating out of all the pores of the right wing uh, media establishment. So this um, character uh, Scott, and again, I'm struck by his gaunt and uh, skeletal uh, appearance. He says, uh, rampant fraud, rampant fraud has broken out. And, and it reminds us of the trope, the typical Trump trope of the rigged election, if you're not winning. They, they are outraged that Mark Elias of the Perkins Coey Law Firm, it's the law firm of the Democratic Party, more or less, uh, so this is not a surprise, um, he hasn't been convicted of anything, as far as I can see, but they say, oh, this is Perkins Coey, 
They're the law firm for Fusion GPS. They're responsible for the steel dossier, which was so detrimental to our hero, Don. So um, Scott says, we won, and I'm going to be governor. The public be damned. Um, we have to watch out for this woman, Bundy. Remember her? She was already bribed by Trump with campaign contributions uh, to get out of a suit against Trump University. He lost anyway. But Bundy is an extremely corrupt individual. And um, the uh, the line on a lot, anybody gets in their way, it's lock him up, lock her up. Um, Scott has no irony. He says, imagine if this was the Republicans doing this to the Democrats. Imagine screaming, dear Scott, that's what happened. That was the 2000 election. <laughs> are, you, are you mentally deteriorated to the point where you can't remember this? That was the stolen election. That gave us eight years of hell under Bush the Younger. So uh, they're, they're concerned that new, new ballots, they're not new ballots, they're uncounted ballots that are ultimately being uh, counted. So that's quite a drama. Trump actually says he's sending lawyers. I'm sure he's not paying, uh, but the Republican National Committee, maybe, or the um, National Republican Senatorial Committee, they probably send some, uh, some lawyers in there. But, again, you've got all kinds of lawyers. This is not a battle of the lawyers, the battle of the lawsuits. Gillum uh, is engaged. He's coming back. Again, I think it was a terrible mistake to quit, but I would also extend that. Beto O'Rourke. You want to get somewhere in today's Democratic Party, show us you're a fighter, Beto. Why are you not fighting? You don't think Cruz stole some votes? I'm sure he did. So you should get out there fighting, too. And then, of course, in Georgia, we have the uh, laudable Stacey Abrams, who is fighting that guy Kemp, and she never stopped because her entire campaign was based on voting rights. This is, after all, Georgia infamous for Lester Maddox, Lester Maddox, one literary dis uh, description of this racist governor of Georgia was Lester Maddox is a 70-year-old baby who wears glasses and is mean. He is one mean 70-year-old baby looking out at you through his lenses. Um, if you listen to this guy, Kemp, we hear him now sometimes on television, you realize why he studiously avoided all national media appearances, because this guy takes you right back to the era of Ross Barnett, George Wallace, Lester Maddox, the great uh, neo-Confederate uh, racist governors of that era. So if Stacy can cut 25,000 votes off of the Kemp total, that's a runoff state, that triggers a runoff, another chance to vote, and another chance to focus resources and national attention on the outrageous, illegal robbing of votes, and uh, of course what, uh, what Kemp is doing is depriving people of their civil rights. If you had a real Justice Department instead of this fraud, right, which is now up for grabs, you would have civil rights division lawyers in there saying, okay, Kemp, we're getting you on criminal charges because you're, you're depriving people of their civil rights. So remember, in these races, there are mail-in ballots for various reasons. People just don't want to show up. It's perfectly okay. There are absentee ballots. There are military ballots. There are provisional ballots. And ballots which have been impounded, like the 53,000 stolen by, by this character, uh, Kemp. So Elias is down there. Snipes is on the job. They're railing against Perkins Coey. And, uh, well, we're hoping. We say congratulations, Senator Nelson. Whatever you do, don't quit. As uh, even Winston Churchill once said, never surrender, never, never, never. Well, that's a pretty good uh, guide. Um, so, uh, so hang in there. That's Florida. Now, in Arizona, we are so delighted to see that 
Kirsten Kirsten Cinema is advancing, and uh, there are several hundred thousand votes left to be counted, and uh, she has now taken the lead. This is, I think, what freaked out the Republicans yesterday was that Cinema had essentially taken the lead over the strident and ideological McSally, uh, who is also a liar because she lies about things things of life and death importance to people like um, pre-existing conditions. So cinema is now ahead, and all we can do is hope that cinema will take it all the way. So that's the second unassigned seat. And then the third one is Mississippi. We have Mike Espy, a former Clinton cabinet official. I think he was the Secretary of Agriculture under Clinton. Um, Mike Espy, African-American, is in a runoff with the uh, the Republican machine candidate down there in Mississippi. So we don't know how this goes, right? If, if the Republicans take all of them, it's 46 to 54. If the Democrats take all of them, it's 49-51, which is exactly where it is now. But there is no victory for the Republicans. And Trump's press conference on Wednesday, of course, was pure raving insanity, pure denial of reality, pure paranoia, I guess, uh, snowbanks of paranoia. No, no reality, only the world of opinions. So... That's where we stand there, which, of course, is very disturbing, right, as that 1945 example points out. We've still got to talk about governors, and we've got to talk about some asses, and we'll be back in a minute. Up here in Washington, D.C., now I've been um, sampling the reactionary radio parrots, starting with Limbaugh today, and you have to remember... A large number of people who call into those shows are paid actors. Those are crisis actors, my dear friends. Uh, one woman called in and said, can't we impose martial law to stop the protests at Tucker Carlson's house? Well, uh, somebody's pushing a line. <clears throat> I don't know how many would be willing to go along. Uh, Trump himself was sort of hemming and uh, Trump. Uh, Limbaugh himself was hanging, hemming and hawing, but this is uh, what they would like to uh, to accomplish. Now, in terms of the governors, hey, in 2006, the Democrats took, I believe, eight governorships, Republicans none, and I think this time around the Republicans got either no governorships or maybe one if they're uh, lucky. I was delighted to see the um, Republican governor of Guam defeated. These are places that, that are important. You're really going to want them when um, the reckoning with uh, the Xi dynasty in China, and for that matter with the Russians, when those things come, you're going to see those islands mean uh, a great deal. So the main thing here with the governors, I would say, I mean, Kansas, the Koch Empire, the Koch uh, plantation breached with freedom. <laughs> There's an opposition in Kansas, right? After all those years of, of uh, Brownback running wild, Kobach defeated. Kobach, the master vote fraud expert, defeated. And a Democratic woman uh, elected. Uh, then we also have New Mexico, uh, Grisham, I believe. And we've got um, Illinois. Round, rounder out, Pritzker in. Pennsylvania stays Democratic. Wisconsin, Scott Walker, this austerity ghoul and ogre, out. And uh, Michigan, it's uh, Rick Snyder out and uh, Kathy uh, Whitmer in. Now, what that means is, suppose you're Trump and you're looking about to see how you're going to get reelected, right? The swing states. What are the swing states, the most important battleground states? Well, how did he win? Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. What's the status? Republican governors out, Democratic governors in. And it means, therefore, that the 20, uh, 2020 election, much harder if you got the governor opposing you, and for the future, for the coming decade, the gerrymander in those states is not going to be run by the Republicans with Rep Republican, fascisto-Republican governors and 
legislature. We are told that the Democrats have picked up about 350 seats in state legislatures. I'm going to confirm that figure, but that is a wonderful uh, start. Remember, under Obama, the losses there had been about 1,000. Well, this makes up about one-third of those um, uh, unspeakable losses. So the governors, seven governorships, and uh, in terms of ballot questions, referenda, on the question of Obamacare, do you want to have the Medicaid expansion? Well, the voters in, let's see if we have this. Uh, we want to get this right because these are, these are the interesting ones. It turns out that every time that you, you put a um, minimum wage on there, they, it passes. <laughs> so uh, what have we got here? Um, there are, uh, in addition to Idaho, I'm, I'm trying to find my list, but you've got Idaho and um, two others. Here we go. Idaho, Nebraska, Utah. There you go. Idaho, Nebraska, Utah say, yes, we want to live. We don't want to die for the profits of the insurance companies based on the ideology of this monstrous Republican Party. So three to 400,000 people get a new lease on life, literally. They can live because they were smart enough to vote themselves Medicaid expansion. Federal money. Don't even have to pay. The state doesn't. Uh, unfortunately, Montana, for some reason, was asked, do you want to extend the Medicaid expansion? And they say no by a margin of 28,000. So I'm not sure of that. And then the referenda, do you want to raise the state minimum wage? This is the one that has never failed in the past 25 or 30 years. It's always going to win. If you can just get it on the ballot, you've got it. Arkansas and Missouri, the land of the Ozarks, has said, yes, we're sick of Republican orthodoxy. Remember Kudlow? He hates the minimum wage. He says federal minimum wage. He hates it in any form. Congratulations to you, Arkansas, Missouri, Idaho, Nebraska, and Utah, right? This goes beyond ideology, but in terms of the sociology, it destroys the position of the Republicans in general, right? Because they say, free market, free market, and we'll swindle you. They leave you nothing but your eyes to, uh, to cry with. So the House, 37 Democratic seats gained. The Senate. Uh, 46 to 51 with three seats undecided. Seven governorships go to the Democrats, 350 seats in the state legislatures. The um, ballot questions, and of course there were more than these, but these are the economically critical ones. And then the masses, the masses. Yes, we're hearing from the masses. Yesterday we had the 5 o'clock demonstrations, and we'll get into the background of this, but the mass strike is also a concrete factor. It's a material force among the masses, and we are the masses. We are the people. We're not the unpopular minority. We are the majority. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Reactionary repukes. The 1,000 demonstrations, at least in every state, in every large city. Uh, they had some pictures of Times Square from above in New York. To me, it looked like 10,000 at least. Here at Lafayette Park in Washington, D.C., 3,000, 5,000, I don't know. Princeton, New Jersey, 500 came out on Nassau Street. Now, this is important because that's the alma mater of Mueller, and I have done some Alumni agitation myself on this uh, front, so he realizes that his uh, his alma mater is um, uh, favorable, uh, sympathetic to his uh, cause. So this is now the situation. The one-party state has been largely uh, defeated, at least for the moment, and the um, the drive towards totalitarian rule can be uh, turned back, and uh, legality can be 
restored. But, of course, you've got to fight, don't you? You've got to fight. And here's where I think one could start fighting. We have this guy Whitaker now, right? Trump has put a hack, a crony, a stooge, a wheel horse from the Iowa Democratic Party, somebody who was vying with Joni Ernst, the hog castrator, to be senator. This uh, Whitaker, well, if, if uh, Whitaker is still there at the Department of Justice by the first week in January, you know what they ought to do? Impeach Whitaker. Just impeach him. You got the majority. Vote to throw that bum out. It's illegal. He's a con artist. He is a uh, you know somebody who engages in fraud. He's a he's a Rico in his own uh, his own right. So Whitaker can be impeached. Now maybe you can't remove him. Maybe not. Probably not. But. It certainly, if you impeach him, that's, that's going to hurt his public image. That's going to slow him down somewhat. <laughs> that will put the fear of God into uh, Trump and some other. So, we'll be back in just a minute on World Crisis. Um. World Crisis Radio, Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. If you haven't already done so, make sure you go to americansystem.tv, americansystem.tv. Become a part of our daily broadcast, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. That is called the American System. Keep up to date, hour by hour, day by day. And we have done some, I think, some pretty decent work in the the last uh, two years. And we have been part of the effort to block the descent into dictatorship. We are, above all, the opponents of the permanent austerity dictatorship. I think we have a clearer idea about that than just about anybody. And we have also been watchdogs on the media chronicling and denouncing their sharp right turn at the end of this election process, to try to make sure that the Democratic victory was not big enough to deprive these greedy corporations, conglomerates, and their holding companies of the Trump tax scam, the Republican tax scam. So we did mention the masses, right, the thousand demonstrations in all the states and and so forth. Those were, of course, the theme was nobody's above the law, not Trump. Protect Mueller, save Mueller. And what it shows is that the independent counsel, my classmate from college, I'm proud to say, is uh, somebody with a mass base. He is an authentic American folk hero. I don't know who else uh, we can mention whose firing would create such a backlash. Now, this was not the real thing. This was uh, real, certainly, but uh, kind of an air raid drill. Uh, because what we're looking at, of course, is Rosenstein and then Mueller above all. They must uh, not be touched. Hands off those. So we, now we've got to take a look at this uh, this awful choice, right? So, again, what you want to do with Whitaker is impeach him. How do we do this? Uh, first of all, he has to recuse himself because he is the author of raving articles and CNN commentaries and phone commentaries, he obviously, like Kavanaugh, I think, uh, embarked on a multi-month, maybe multi-year effort to get himself uh, appointed. Notice that Whitaker was recommended by Leonard Leo, the sinister Leonard Leo. Sometimes he looks like he's the secret dictator of the United States, or at least he's the dictator of the judicial branch, and he seems to be wrecking the judicial branch. So Leonard Leonard Leo of the Sovereign Military Order of Malta, S-M-O-M, Los Mom, headquarters in Rome, the right wing of the uh, Catholic Church, I guess, and others. And um, this is now exercising inordinate 
unacceptable, scandalous, outrageous influence on these judicial nominations. So Leonard Leo chose Roberts, Alito, Gorsuch, and now, of course, Kavanaugh. And now he's chosen Whitaker, too. Aren't we getting a little bit too much Leonard Leo, a little bit too much Federalist Society? I would say so. So former Attorney General... Alberto Gonzalez says, if the ethics experts in the Department of Justice tell Whitaker he needs to recuse himself, then he needs to. What has he had to say? Well, he's had, he's had all kinds of uh, op-eds. He's written op-eds for, uh, and op-eds and commentaries on CNN, The Hill, various local radio stations. He says that, uh, the Mueller investigation is overreaching. The implication is that Mueller's actions are ultra vires, beyond his power. No, they're not. They're absolutely authorized and necessary. They're our lifeline to maintain all the freedoms that we've had so far. So this guy Whitaker comes in. You can see he's got the, the, the intellectual profile of one of these Republican right-wing media goons and, of course, uh, kind of brain damage, too, like uh, so many of them, right? Incapable of being honest. He's a crony of Sam Clovis. Remember Sam Clovis? He was the guy who uh, was the um, the supervisor, I guess you'd say, of Papadopoulos. Right? Papadopoulos would say, we get a meeting with Putin. What do you think? Sam Clovis says, go for it. I love it. Maybe not quite that way, but that was the idea. So um, he's He's got all of these um, things going on. He uh, he also has uh, some pretty wild uh, opinions, right? He has said that the way to deal with Mueller is maybe not to fire him directly, but to starve him and strangle him through budgetary processes, obviously to limit the investigation. Now, this is it's unconstitutional as. We have uh, Conway, that's the husband of Kellyanne Conway, and Neil Katyal, former Solicitor General of the United States. Their op-ed in the New York Times of Thursday makes clear that if you want to be the head of an executive department, you've got to be approved by the Senate. You've got to be confirmed by the Senate. And this guy, Whitaker, has not been since, uh, well, more than 10 or 12 years ago when he became the U.S. Attorney of Southern uh, Iowa, well, that's no longer valid. So there are other people who would uh, be available, Rosenstein, recently confirmed, and even others, but not Whitaker. Obviously, Whitaker put out these signals to Trump saying, I don't believe that you can be investigated uh, he has he has said all, all kinds of uh, of crazy things. He has said that um, that Marbury versus Madison. So he, he's attacking the the opinions of the greatest Supreme Court figure in the United States history, which is John Marshall of Virginia, right? The the founding father who is often forgotten, but whose role is absolutely critical in preserving uh, this country. He thinks that uh, Marbury versus Madison was poorly decided. That's the basis of judicial review, um, meaning that if you don't have Marbury versus Madison in that tradition, first of all, you're no conservative. You're a wild radical because that's the tradition, Marbury versus Madison. Um, he says, no, no, not that. The judicial branch, he says, really is a very weak branch of government. And he wants to go back, as he said, he thinks that the New Deal decisions – of the Supreme Court were bad, the ones after 1937. Remember the switch in time that saved nine? Well, after that, the Supreme Court, following the election returns, had to accept modernity and the Roosevelt administration and the New Deal. But no, says uh, says our friend here, Kat, uh, Whitaker, he says, no, we got to go back to Lochner. Lochner is that the government cannot regulate economic activity. Child labor laws are not uh, constitutional. Mike Lee of the Senate will love that. Wages and hours, impossible. Minimum wage can't be done. No federal legislation on economics. That's what this guy will, uh, will be standing for. So uh, 
he's got a, he's got a bunch of other uh, opinions, but this is probably enough for for most persons of uh, of goodwill. So the only question now is how to get him out. Uh, Don Trump may be the first one to get him out, right? As Trump was leaving for Paris and the 100th anniversary of the armistice in World War One, the end of the fighting on the Western Front. Uh, Trump said uh, he he he, uh, he uh, had some um, some sort of dubious things to say about Whitaker. He said, "I don't know him." <laughs> he lied, obviously. Nothing new, not news, not worth reporting. But Trump uh, came out there and uh, he's agitated, right? He said, uh, "I don't know him. I don't know him. I've never met him. I've never talked to him. These are all lies." Of course, typical Trump, blatant, barefaced uh, lies. And he says he's highly respected. He's highly respected. Well, he's not highly respected. He's a notorious scammer. What's five million dollars for his company? Stir Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. So, um, Whitaker, picked with the help of Leonard Leo of the Federalist Society and the Sovereign Military Order of Malta. Uh, he gave an interview to The Hill. He commented to CNN. He says that the Mueller investigation is overreaching. It's a fishing expedition. It's not legitimate. They should not delve into the finances of the Trump entourage, the family, so to speak. Um, and, of course, this is um, wrong. The instructions say anything that arises. He says within the four corners of that uh, charge, mandate, yeah, it's within it. Uh, Whitaker will not recuse himself, even though he has expressed opinions about the things that he's going to decide. He's obviously going to try to block any subpoenas for Trump, and he's going to try to recuse himself never, never, ever. So uh, we want him to keep in mind uh, Richard Kleindienst, the attorney general under Nixon. He was lucky. He only got a 30-day a sentence for a misdemeanor conviction, or I think perjury, and he didn't serve it. But John Mitchell, the real heavy-duty attorney general of the Nixon years, he went to jail for several years. So uh, that's a hot seat you're on there, uh, Whitaker. Don't let hubris uh, take over. And again, these crazy things about the weakness of the a judicial branch, the strong executive that he wants, overweening, overreaching, unchecked executive. This is all uh, absolutely uh, crazy. So, uh, as I say, today Trump says that uh, he doesn't know him. I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know him. He's very agitated. Uh, he treats him now like a temp. Whitaker is a temp. Well, the temp, if he's still there in January, impeach him, impeach him out the door. Uh, and he's highly respected. Well, he's not highly respected. Here we have the Washington Post. Above the fold on the front page, Whitaker was paid by a firm which was branded as a scam by the Federal Trade Commission. A scammer. So the Attorney General acting is now a scammer. And then some say he's going to have to do a lot of acting to get out of this one. He's going to have to use the Stanislavski method of acting uh, to escape <laughs> these realities. So federal investigators in 2017 uh, were investigating this company called World Patent Marketing, accusing it of misleading investors and promising them that it would help them to patent and then profit from their inventions. So it's investors and inventors. I think the uh, Washington Post is sporting some typos here on the front page. Anyway, the FTC, and um, this was something that said patent marketing. So we'll. Uh, it's probably something you've heard the ads, right? If you're a if you're an inventor, then we you know we'll help you. Is this the one with George Foreman? I don't know. But you get the idea. Um, so the fine imposed 
was in the neighborhood of $25 million. Gee, I wonder if he ever paid that. Of course, maybe not him personally, but the the company. Um, and then we even have some victims. Uh, one inventor, quoted by the Washington Post, said he lost $77,000 after he paid World Patent Marketing to help him bring to market his idea for a social media app to help the disabled. And they took him to the cleaners. Um, and, uh, again, it's a really hefty fine. $25 million to close up shop. So it's gone. And, again, I wonder what happened to that, right? Is this, uh, is this still hanging around his uh, neck? They, um, they asked a member of the advisory board. The feds asked the advisory board of World Patent Marketing, and the guy that they found was uh, Matthew G. Whitaker, former U.S. attorney in the Southern District of Iowa. So this is the guy. And again, he did a media campaign. He became a, a paid CNN commentator to come on and attack Mueller. So that is a tremendous problem in terms of the Department of Justice rules. We hope if the Department of Justice is really a Department of Justice and not just a, well, not something else, uh, let them now come forward. You can do a lot of things. Bureaucratic uh, inefficiency can be accentuated. In other words, the slows. You can give him the slows, right? You say, yes, sir, we'll be doing it right away, and in two weeks nothing gets done because we've only got uh, November, December until the Democrats uh, come in and take over the House, at which point he becomes a prime target. He claims, Trump claims, that he never talked to him, did not discuss Mueller or anything else, this is obviously a lie. This is really one of the biggest whoppers that we've seen in recent times. So Trump saying, I don't know him, sounds like what we've been led to believe, that the Trump White House, ignoramuses as they are, fools, never bothered to research the guy's background. So the, the, the backlash against Whitaker on Thursday in particular, starting Wednesday and into Thursday, was overwhelming. The, the public opinion is absolutely against him. And those the thousand demonstrations, save Mueller, protect Mueller, nobody's above the law, 10,000 plus in Times Square and Broadway, marching too. Uh, that's all anti Whitaker. Think of it. Um, and uh, Trump also signaled that maybe Kellyanne will be on her way out, saying, oh, do you mean uh, the guy who co authored the op ed? George Conway III, I think, along with uh, Kat Yal. You mean Mr. Kellyanne Conway? Mm hmm. So it doesn't look so good for her. But uh, now, the replacement. How about this? Who is it going to be? It's very funny. You see the people that Trump th seems to be considering. They're all tainted. They're all going to have to recuse themselves. How about Chris Christie? Chris Christie. Are you going to have to recuse yourself because you were part of the Trump campaign, which is being investigated by Mueller? Yes, you were an integral part. You were a spokes. You were in the transition. You were all over Trump. You wanted to be attorney general then. So, Christie, you will have to recuse yourself. Does that make him less attractive to Don? I think so. How about uh, Attorney General Bundy, Pam Bundy of Florida. We mentioned this is the woman who let herself get <laughs> her head turned by huge campaign contributions from Don to drop the lawsuit against her, the Florida role, the lawsuit against Trump University. Back in a minute. Back to World Crisis Radio. So we we're saying, Christy, you appoint him to the uh, Department of Justice. He'll have to recuse himself because an integral part of the Trump campaign. He'd be investigating himself. It can't be done. Not, I don't think. Uh, not if these words on the page mean anything. And these are all textuals. So Christie, not suitable. Have to recuse. Bondi, have to recuse because of this conflict of interest. Trump gave her large campaign contributions, and she dropped out of the lawsuit on Trump University. How about Rudy Giuliani? Not such a good idea. Widely discredited. 
completely partisan, but above all, was a part of the Trump campaign that he would then be investigating. Some have even dug up this guy, Barr, uh, Barr, uh, who was the attorney general under Bush the Elder. This goes, this takes us back to, I think, 1991. Um, Barr went back to Pennsylvania. He was expecting a coronation. He didn't find it. He found Harris Wofford, who defeated him. And that was one of the signs of the coming end of the Mad Dog Bush Sr., Bush 41, George H.W. Bush administration. And, uh, well, uh, that's the way that looks. The Democrats have got to show people that they're willing to fight. Now, we got two things to cover, economics and World War I. Let's um, remind ourselves now, what has happened in the oil markets is, uh, is dramatic. Uh, looks like the stock market, the Dow closed down about 200. The S&P closed at 2781. I think that's still slightly over the 200-day. By the way, we have a possible death cross in the Russell 2000, where the 50-day moving average seems to be falling below the 200-day moving average. We'll look into that. But the big thing is the oil market. You now have an oil bear in at least West Texas Intermediate, and I think beyond that. Uh, the West Texas Intermediate has now been down 10 days in a row. This has not happened since 1984. It is a dramatic event. And it seems to point towards a world economic slowdown. In my language, a world economic contraction. Uh, look at this. China is contracting. Europe and Japan stagnating. And the U.S. is in chaos we're also told that the Saudis had been pumping oil like mad to help Trump cushion the impact of these Iran sanctions, which were reapplied, reapplied on Monday. I think also the Saudis were trying to bribe him to lay off Khashoggi scandal issues. Um, but Trump, <laughs> Trump turned around and said, okay, we have these powerful sanctions against Iran, but I'm going to give a waiver to China so my, my friend Xi can buy everything he wants. So, look, ZTE, great way to attack China, should be done, defend the U.S. No, nope. bad for Chinese jobs. Uh, and in this case, Iran. Iran is supposed to be the end of the world, and this is their biggest customer, China. Oh, no, we, want to, we don't want to appear, interfere with that. So Trump um, talking out of both sides of his uh, idiotic uh, mouth. So um, this is a, a bad uh, economic situation. So the general idea is that economic activity is shrinking worldwide, and therefore there's so much oil. I think that makes a lot of sense. That is obviously very bad news. Uh, we should mention that in the election, Trump, the Republicans, have already lost one of the 13 keys to the presidency. Take a look at this. This is going to be interesting to follow now over the next two years. Alan J. Lichtman of American University. The book is called The Keys to the White House. He does several editions. The first one is party mandate. Party mandate. After the midterm election, now, the, the incumbent party, Republicans, holds more seats in the House of Representatives than after the previous midterm election, 2014. Is that true? No, it's false. So there's one. If the Republicans lose six of these keys, they're likely to be on their way out. Now, we'll go through it. There's a scandal key they're losing, social unrest key they're losing, I think charisma they're losing. And what it's going to revolve around is short-term economics, long-term economics. Those are two, two keys. Well, a world economic contraction is obviously not such a good uh, thing to run on. Now, in our remaining time, we um, would have been obviously highly interested, delighted to devote more interest, more time to the end phase of the First World War, 
We did quite a bit about the opening phase back in the summer of uh, 2014, the 100th anniversary. So uh, we'd just like to focus now on 1918, which is the great focus. Trump will be in Paris. The ceremonies of the French are on um, nine, uh, Sunday. The main thing to remember here is this was 20 million dead for limited reasons, really, uh, and no reason at all from the point of view of the average person in these allied countries. You now look at the demagogues, right, these political cockroaches, the um, various uh, Brexiteers, uh, Salvini, Le Pen, the, uh, the alternatives for Germany and so forth. They want to break up the European Union. Well, what does the European Union mean <clears throat> practically? It means the longest period of peace with no wars that Europe has seen in a hundred years, or ever, really ever. Uh, go back to World War I, and you'll see what it means to have the, all these small countries, right? The German word is die Kleinstaaterei, small statism. Die Kleinstaaterei, which I've always had contempt for, because these are narrow, hidebound little entities, right? Take a look at the Holy Roman Empire, oh, you know, Pre-1600, the crazy quilt, right? The count of the uh, of the farm stall, right? Graf von Saustall, the count of the pigsty. Um, it got down to that level. So this is no good. Modern progress cannot be realized. And this is the opinion also of Heinrich Mann, which I'll uh, go through, right, about how small thinking was the curse of uh, Germany for so long. But now... The, uh, there are two, two points to make, right? Two sort of historical points. One is the war ended on November 11th, 1918. Now notice, Pershing, this is one of our, our, uh, villains of the peace. General John Pershing, Blackjack, right? Pershing's own. This guy was, had so much contempt for the American people in human life. He was a Wall Street general. He was a Wall Street general. I just saw General Odierno, uh, formerly of the Army, now of J.P. Morgan. Oh, my God. Well, J.P. Morgan is pretty much what ran what man Pershing. He had a, a J.P. Morgan representative, and that was this guy, um, um, Morrow, Dwight Morrow, in his headquarters. So he kept in touch with Wall Street. He had a Wall Street envoy right in his headquarters. Anyway, this guy had so much contempt for the American people, he said, Ah, we've got 24 hours until 11 o'clock in the morning on November 11th, uh, 1918, 11, 11, 11, the famous one. And he, um, he, he said, what we're going to do is we're going to keep attacking until the last minute. So hundreds, thousands of doughboys, American soldiers, died for absolute folks because of this awful person. The Burns is really a street person for fascism uh, in the United States and worldwide. Back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpey here in uh, Washington, D.C. So I'm um, trying to say a few things about World War I here at the end of the show, right? One ha 100 years after it ended. Of course, from another point of view, it never ended. Um, and this was the villainy, really, of Pershing, supposedly this great guy. And, and um, the real, the most um, effective American general of World War I, just as in World War II, General Douglas MacArthur. And uh, he was the most decorated. He was the hero of the American expeditionary force. And he was, therefore, the object of envy and sabotage really all his life from people like George Marshall, who uh, never really won a um, battle decoration. He got a silver star, I think, for logistics. But um, MacArthur must have gotten six silver stars, two distinguished service crosses, the most decorated, the hero, and deservedly so. So here's the idea. It was um, we've had the Second Battle of the Marne, Germans defeated, falling back. And at this point, then, it's, what are you going to do next? Well, Pershing, this dummy, 
and Butcher, comes up with this idea, say, let's attack the German salient at San Miguel, and then from there, let's go into the, um, the Meuse Argonne. Now, the Meuse Argonne today means almost nothing to anybody. If you know Gettysburg, you think that's the biggest battle in American history? It is not. It's the Meuse Argonne with about 1.1, 1.2 million U.S. soldiers taking part and about, uh, what, 100,000 uh, casualties, um, 122,000 casualties, 27,000 killed, and 96,000 uh, wounded. It's um, significant. It's the biggest battle in American history. And a lot of the historians say, well, this was really uh, uh, secondary. It was uh, big for the U.S., but it was really limited. It was secondary, blah, blah, blah. Well, no. Um, here's what we have. By about the middle of September, before Pershing had actually started this attack on the uh, salient, that's, uh, that's the Battle of San Miguel, two couple of days' worth, September 12th. So MacArthur and his Rainbow Division, the 42nd Division, are pushing forward. They find that the German resistance is weak and disorganized. So he says, you know what, I bet we could punch through to the city of Metz. This is Alsace-Lorraine. I think it's Alsace, uh, but it's in Alsace-Lorraine at that time. The German, they called it imperial territory, it was under Germany. Right? This is one of the reasons that things got so difficult. So MacArthur says, let's go and see what the defenses of Metz look like. So uh, they do. Uh, he gets uh, an aide to come with him. So he says, uh, the night after the taking of San Miguel, MacArthur, accompanied by an adjutant, slipped through no man's land, through the enemy lines, across an old battlefield, and up the slope of a hill. On the summit, he raised his binoculars and peered eastward towards the stronghold of Metz. There he saw the lights of automobiles and trucks, lights betraying heavy traffic in and around the fortress. The very fact that the Germans were not observing blackout increased their vulnerability, revealed it. And MacArthur wrote in his memoirs, as I had suspected, Metz was practically defensive for the moment. Its combat garrison had been temporarily withdrawn to support other sectors of the action. Here was an unparalleled opportunity to break the Hindenburg line at its pivotal point. There it lay, our prize wide open for the taking. Take it, and we would be in an excellent position to cut off South Germany from the rest of the country. It would lead to the invasion of Central Germany by way of the practically undefended Moselle, Moselle Valley wines. Right? Victory, uh, victory at Metz would cut the great lines of communication and supply for the entire German front, and might bring the war to a quick close. So he says, let's punch through. The entire supply system for the whole German Western Front would collapse, and then the war would end. Two months early, two months early. And Pershing later conceded he was right, without a doubt. That advance to Metz would have carried well beyond the Hindenburg Line and possibly into uh, Metz. So this was now MacArthur saying this is the, um, the problem with these military leaders, right, the mediocrities. Um, this was the great lost opportunity of the end phase of the war, and MacArthur wrote in his memoirs, it was an example of inflexibility in the pursuit of previously conceived ideas. In other words, making a picture uh, when you stick to it, right, and you don't change. It's too frequent in modern warfare, and he laments the fact that decisions are made by hidebound generals sitting far in the rear. This is, uh, this is of course, uh, Marshall, uh, well, Marshall and uh, Marshall as the aide to uh, Pershing, his uh, protege. So, look at this. The whole war could have ended two months earlier. And now, the second point, 
We have this uh, interesting journalist, George Seldes. You can get his books. Um, you can get uh, Facts and Fascism. But how about this? At the end of World War I, Seldes, George Seldes is out there uh, trying, to, trying to get something different. So he breaks away from most of the press corps. He drives into, well, into the, he drives through the repeat, you know, retreating and now no longer shooting German forces, and he gets an interview with the top German commander, Field Marshal Paul von Hindenburg, the supreme commander of the German army. And Hindenburg says to him, you know, the United States played the key role in defeating Germany at the end of the war. Here's the quote. Quote from Hindenburg, the American infantry won the world war in the battle in the Argonne. Seldes and the others were accused uh, of um, breaking the armistice. In other words, Pershing and company didn't want this published, so they suppressed it. They were forbidden to write anything about the interview. This is military censorship. The interview never appeared in the American news media, the newspapers at the time. Seldes, the author here, this enterprising journalist, he said, blocking this publication was tragic because without Hindenburg's direct testimony of Germany's military defeat, many Germans relapsed into this stab-in-the-back theory, right? Die Dolch Stoss Legende, stab in the back, that Germany had not really been defeated, but had been betrayed in Berlin by socialists, communists, and Jews. That's the Nazi line at the beginning. This is what this was Hitler's stock in trade. So uh, um, the um, the comment then from Seldes is, if the Hindenburg interview had been allowed through by the censors of Pershing at the time, it would have headlined in every country civilized enough to have newspapers and undoubtedly would have made an impression on millions of people and become an important page in history. Seldes, I believe, he continues, that it would have destroyed the main planks on which Hitler rose to power and it would have prevented World War II, the greatest and worst war in history, and it would have changed the future of all mankind for the better. So look that up. And as far as Acosta is concerned, Jim Acosta was trying to ask, what happened to the caravan? What happened to the caravan? And Trump had to shut him down. Try to. So we urge everybody, keep fighting, get active, get video active. Stay tuned to the Mueller question. If uh, Trump makes a move, it's time to go into the streets. Yeah, next week on World Crisis Radio, tune in on Monday for the American System. American TV.